Well, hello to you all this, uh, this morning, whether you are viewing us this Sunday morning or whatever time you are, you are joining us. You'll be seeing three faces today on your screens. They'll be mine, of course, Jim Chalmers and then Julie Foggle. Now, uh, I've been asked to tell you that we're all socially distanced, so that's, uh, we need to be, make, you need to be assured of, of that. I'm going to open with a, with a short prayer to bring us into our Lord's presence. Lord God, as your people, we offer you our sacrifice of prayer and worship. We have come from different walks of life. Some have walked with you for many years. Others have just started their journey. Some are strong, others are weak. Some are full of joy, others burdened by care. You love each one of us in equal measure. You pour your blessings on us in equal measure. But we pray this morning, be with us as we start our service here today. Amen. I still feel that this is a very strange way of getting in touch with you all, but it's better than the alternative, which of course is not getting in touch at all. It gives us a chance in our busy lives to reconnect with God and also be aware of our fellow Christians in the neighbourhood and further afield throughout the world. I hope and pray that you are coping well during this pandemic, particularly as restrictions are starting to relax. My wife and I have been out shopping, with masks of course, and we are taking a day's holiday in Kendall very shortly, so things are obviously improving. One of the things I said a couple of weeks ago on these online services, I pointed out the difference between optimism and hope. Now optimism, I remind you, looks at the world and at a situation and says things like, things are looking up and everything is going to be fine. But, and of course, sometimes it is, but also sometimes it isn't. Whereas hope is a dogged and deliberate choice to keep on going when everything seems dark and negative. Many of us during this pandemic will be feeling down and fearful of the future. And even though things are getting better, worry can get the better of us. God in the scriptures that we read make it clear that he can be trusted. He can be true to his promises and be close to those who love him. Even though they go through terrible suffering, he will be there at the end of it. So what are we truly hoping for? I reckon the hope to be free from the things that cause us pain and suffering, because the things that do cause this are countless. There's physical pain, there's emotional pain, and of course the pain of being aware of the suffering of others that we care about. Pain can be to do with bereavement and loss, the loss of freedom, control, or independence. The hope of Christians is that one day our Lord Jesus will come and stand before us. He will bless us and make us more like him so that we can in fact be like him. This means that we will be away from all those fears and pains that are consuming our lives today and of course into the future. Our Christian hope is that this will come about in due time. Until that happens, we can be sure that our Lord will always be beside us, sustaining us, and we will never be completely on our own. Because we need to remember that we have an anchor in our life that is secure, and that anchor is Christ our Lord. I was in the Scouts when I was young, and from time to time enjoyed meeting up in local churches with the Boys Brigade. We did sing plenty of hymns in our scout group at Church Parade, but not the one I'm about to read. I have to tell you, it was very, very old-fashioned back then. And I don't, I don't actually think I've sung it since. Many of you may know it. It's called, Will Your Anchor Hold? Don't worry, we're not singing it this morning, but I thought I would read part of it to you today. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfurl their wings of strife. When the strong tides lift and the cables strain. 
Will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Lord, in this time of uncertainty and negativity, we thank you that you are our unending hope and give you thanks and praise that you are our anchor and will always keep us secure. Keep us firm in our unending love and service for you. Amen. So now it's over to Jim who will bring God's word to us. Thank you, it's good to see you. Well, hello and uh, good morning. It's lovely to see you all again. Well, at least I can't, but it's lovely for you to see me. Not because it's me, but because we're in church for the first time, for a long, long time. And isn't it good that we made one step back to normality, but it's uh, not true normality yet, is it? Uh, because most of you aren't here and uh, it's a very lonely place this morning, this after this evening, this church. Um, there's, it's very nice and spick and span, I can tell everybody, uh, that uh, some good work's been done with clearing it out and it looks wonderful. You'll enjoy when you come back to it, I'm sure. Our reading this morning is Isaiah 44, verses 66 to 8. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? No. There is no rock. I know not one. And those are lovely verses, aren't they? Very affirming verses. Ones that tell us exactly about who our God is. Very encouraging words that we have here. But you know... As we read those verses, it's great to know who God is, but it's more important, I believe, to know a little bit about the context where these verses come. They come at a time when things had not been very good for the children of Israel. Well, to say not very good would be an understatement. They'd been in exile in Babylon for many years. They'd been thrown out of Israel, they'd been thrown out of Jerusalem, They'd been brought as slaves to another country, to one that wasn't their home, one where they had to live with in subservience to other people. And uh, they'd been there a long time. Perhaps most of the children of Israel would not have remembered even what Jerusalem looked like, because many of them had been born in exile. Not a good situation, you might say for which these words can come and encourage them. And I just wonder how the children of Israel took those words, because they would be, I believe by that time, very unsure of what their future was going to be. It had been very negative, and uh, it didn't seem to have changed very much. There seemed no sign that they would be returning home again. Perhaps they'd even forgotten that wish. Maybe they'd even sort of uh, drop that to a, a low point in their priorities as day by day they lived in exile and had got probably used to that sort of work, that, that life and felt there would be no other for them. So these words come to the children of Israel just at that time. They wouldn't really, I believe, feel that God could redeem them. They were nice words and perhaps they even believed that God was a strong God and a good God, but maybe he didn't love them that much. Maybe he wasn't going to help them that much. He certainly hadn't given them a way to return home, and that's surely what they really, deep down, would have wanted. And uh, they didn't know that just at this very soon after this, Cyrus would become king of the Babylonians, 
and they would be released, that God would put it upon his heart to release them. They didn't know that God was working away and doing that. They lived before that had happened and they just didn't know that was on the cards. And uh, they were going to be surprised by that. But God wanted them to turn to him. He wanted them to trust in him in a very real way. And as I read those words and as I sort of looked into the background of the situation, I thought it's very much like us today, isn't it? We live in a changed world, a world that uh, a few months ago we would never believe we would be in. And I'm sure it's been said many times and in many sermons that we live in a sort of world that perhaps won't change again. And maybe that's attitude of the children of Israel, that they didn't think that God was going to help them, that God was going to support them, that he was that great God who he was. Maybe that's how we feel. Maybe we can see no end to lockdown. Maybe it's eased in certain ways, but then again, we hear in the news so often that we expect the virus to return sometime in the autumn and that we'll be locked down more severely again. We look at Leicester and see what's happened there. And even in Warsaw, they were considering it, weren't they, at one time a few weeks ago, whether they should go towards lockdown again. But uh, mercifully, the virus didn't control us that much at that time. Distancing, do we believe that's going to be a way of life for us from now on? Uh, maybe that from now on we'll only be two metres apart from people most of the time. Uh, not being able to travel anywhere very with ease. It's uh, having to book ahead to get a train or to, uh, to go anywhere that we might want to go to. All those things seem to be a different way of life. And we probably feel that forever, we or forever in our minds, that we'll be like living like this. That's how the children of Israel must have felt in a much more strong way about where they were in, the Babylonia, in Babylonia. So, these words, however, that we've just read this, this morning, are very strong in telling us that that's not going to be so. Because God is a God who loves his people. But more than that, he's not just a, a God who wants things for us and wants to see good things for us. He's not just a good God in that way, but he's got the strength and ability and power to change things. Do you believe that this morning? That whatever situation you're in, whether you're feeling negative about lockdown in the future of this country or any of the world as a whole or other problems in your life, do you believe that God can change those situations, that he can minister to you, that he can bring light into your life in whatever way he wants to do that? So, maybe we see a parallel here. And as we read these words, we see what sort of God that we've got. I remember not so long ago, there was a book written, maybe it was a long ago and I'm getting old. There was a book written about, that said, your God is too small. I don't know if you ever read that book, but I did. And as I read it, I realised that what the author was trying to say was that we don't have the expectations that God will bless and deliver and do good things and be with us in all situations. I wonder how big is our God? Is he someone that is over these things or some of them that just goes along with them? Well, we've got a very wonderful picture of what God's like. As we read the verses, we see that he's the first and the last, the only God. The God who can do wonderful good deeds. A God who knows the future. A, know, a God who will deliver Israel. And many more things. Well, we could look at all these things this morning, but I don't think you want to listen to me for that long. It would take us too long to look at all those things. I just want to dip into these wonderful truths and underline them and show us to what extent God is able. 
Let's just look at a few of these words. In the beginning it says there's no one like him. Uh, and I know we, we often sing a song here at St Thomas's, which is, There is no one like Jehovah. Now I would sing it to you today, but you've been too good. And I can't deliver you from, and I can't uh, put that upon you. But you know, there is no God like our Jehovah. One who not only loves us, but is able to deliver us from the problems that we have. You know, all the Israelites must have uh, come across many um, gods at their time. There were the sun gods, the gods of Baal, and all sorts of other gods that these other nations that they were in contact with had. And they must have known all these gods, and they must have been tempted to think maybe we should follow them. But all those gods were not like our God. They weren't true. They weren't overall. They weren't loving of the people. They weren't those, they weren't someone who could uh, do wonderful things. Talks about God being the first and the last. Well, a lot of the idols at that time had to be created and they had to be renewed if they grew old and a bit crumbly. But God was before them and after them. God was before society was created, before man was created, and he'll be there at the end of the world as well. He is the first and the last. And also, uh, he is the one who, it is said, there is none like him, there is no other true God. Perhaps the word that I think comes around us strongly is the fact that God is our rock. And uh, I know a lot of people that uh, have found real comfort in that. There's another song we sing, There is no rock like our God. Precious cornerstone, we stand on him alone. There is no rock like our God. Rocks are things that are solid and are there, that uh, don't easily uh, crumble, that don't easily disintegrate, that are strong and you can rely on them. As you go up a mountain, you put your foot upon a rock to ensure that you've got a good foundation for your climb. You can put your hands into them and be sure that you can hold on in all those circumstances. And God's a, lot, a rock like that. Whatever our circumstances, we can put our hand into his and know that it is firmly there, that he won't let go, he won't say, that uh, we're not worthy, he won't say I don't love you anymore, he won't do anything like that because he loves us. And he will be our rock and our salvation and our secure place for eternity. So God is our rock. And you know, I know that uh, if the children of Israel had felt, known that securely, they would have trusted him. And they would have been right to, wouldn't they? Because just after this, God does deliver them from Babylon. They are allowed to go and they're restored. You can trust God for that. Just like that, as we live in this time of COVID and uncertainty, and other uncertainties in our life perhaps, we should know firmly that we can trust God for the future. We don't know the future. I don't know about you, I've often wondered, would it be a good thing if I knew the future? What would I do? Uh, what would I feel if I knew that tomorrow I was going to be run over by a bus? Uh, well, you know, maybe <laughs> that wouldn't be so good to know. But God knows our future. And he wants good things for us. He wants to bless us. We can be assured of that. And so, as we come to the end of this uh, sermon, I just want to assure you that just as the Israelites found salvation in their God and he restored them to their land, he can restore to us. And he, there's a, in the verses before, he talks about what this restoration would be like. He talks about green grass, flowing streams and refreshment. 
What a lovely picture, especially if you lived in the desert as these people lived, of the good things that what God would bring, of fertility of the soil, of the land, of being able to grow crops, of being refreshed by the water. That's the sort of refreshment and goodness that God is going to bring. I want to end with the words of a song that might have, um, you know, sum up how much we should respond to this. It goes like this. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could wait for all eternity long and find there is none like you. So this morning, what is our attitude? Is our attitude to look for our um, salvation in things that are around us, in our friends, our families, in our football teams, whatever it might be, in our posh cars? Or is it to put our trust in our Lord and Saviour, knowing that God has shown himself to be trustworthy? We've seen him in the pages of Scripture to be a good God. And he's yesterday, today, forever. Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his wonderful name. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can be assured that we have a rock for our salvation. For someone, for a saviour who died for us on that cross. Who took our sins on himself and who assures us of his concern for our lives and who wants to lead us, maybe in the difficult ways that lie ahead in our countries, whichever country we live in, and wants to bless us, and wants to bring refreshment, and wants us to live fulfilling lives for his name. Amen. to make space in our services at St Thomas to reflect on the sermon that we've just heard. God always speaks through his word and can use the preacher to bring particular issues to our minds and to our attention, not just collectively but also personally. A sermon isn't a passive thing that we just listen to but we play our part as we lean our mind and our spirit to what God is saying to us personally and today. So maybe just close your eyes as I read again that passage from Isaiah in the light of what Jim has opened up to us. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let, me, let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there a God beside me? There is no rock, I know not any. Is every aspect of our life submitted to the authority of the God who is above everything? Or do we hang on to some things because we need to be in control and fear letting go and trusting God? Do we try to be God in our own life? Do we believe that the world itself and our destiny can be entrusted to the God who is first and last in creation, but also with us in our life, from birth to the end of our time here. Hear God's words today in your areas of concern and anxiety. Fear not. Choose to believe God over the shouting of your fears when he says you will find no greater security 
than in himself, your rock. So let's now turn outwards from ourselves as we pray for others now. Lord, we lift our world before you. Conscious that as the virus is receding here, it is still increasing in other countries. We pray for mercy and miracles in those places with poor health care and where hygiene measures are almost impossible. Lord, intervene where only you can halt the spread of this disease in those places. And in developed countries, we ask for wisdom for the leaders in decision making, for breakthroughs in understanding of how this virus works, and especially for a supernatural speeding up of an effective vaccine. Father, I ask that you help each of us to play a part in the battle against the virus of misinformation that is undermining government's efforts and is already costing lives. Lord, the source of all light and truth, shine your light on the fake news, the pseudoscience and the conspiracy theories that are seeping into some people's thinking and affecting their decisions through social media or YouTube. Help us, Lord, never to share something that we haven't fact-checked with a reliable source and give us the courage to challenge those who do. Lord, enlighten those who see the closing of churches as an attack on their faith or who see lockdown as a challenge to their human rights or who spread lies about the virus. Lord, bring clarity and truth where there are lies and confusion and come against the father of lies who lurks behind it all. As our country starts some semblance of normality, Lord, I pray that you would help us each to make wise decisions for ourselves and for our family. Lord, give us a realistic instinct for what we personally can safely do at this time. Help those with exaggerated fears to overcome them and to get out and do what they need to do. But give wisdom too to those who might become too blasé. For those who know you, Lord, help us to truly hear your voice as we seek to serve you, but want to care for our health too. Be with our churches as some resume services in their buildings, but also to be able to continue to worship together online. We thank you for Andy who has pioneered our services and pray for those also now taking this on to give them the time and the skills that they need. Thank you, Lord, that you are not on furlough, but are working in new ways. Help us to engage with teaching, with worship and reading, that we don't backslide spiritually at this time, but can still partner with you in mission. And we now bring before the Lord those who need his touch or intervention at this time. We pray for those we know or ourselves who may be suffering emotionally or mentally with this situation. Help people to reach out, and us to reach out to them. Help people to recognise strongholds and defaults creeping back into their lives. Whether addictions or bad habits, just turned to to numb the negativity or the anxiety. Lord, bring help and peace and your presence, we pray. We lift Vera before you, Lord, as her breast cancer has returned, and we just pray that you would speed her safely home from New Zealand at the end of July. And we just pray that the operation scheduled at the Manor Hospital, that that, that would happen very promptly and very efficiently. And we just pray for Vera for your healing and for your peace at this time. And we lift Kate Mason before you, Lord, who had a cancer diagnosis last week. 
Lord, give her peace in the waiting as she awaits further results from tests. And Lord, we pray for a quick and efficient surgery for her. Lord, we thank you that this problem was found as it was, and we just indeed pray for your healing for her, Lord. And we pray for Helen Bray, who's broken her wrist, and we pray that um, even by now, that the operation that she needs will have taken place safely, and that you would speed up her healing, Lord. And I particularly pray that she would be able to get the practical help that she needs with shopping and other practical needs. We lift Eric Peel before you, Lord. We pray for the result of the latest CT scan that he's had, but we thank you that the preliminary results from his MRI scan show that the cancer is continuing to shrink, and we just really praise your name for that, Lord. But we do pray for the ongoing investigations into his poor mobility, especially the right leg, and the pain and the problem that he has that has still not been diagnosed. And Lord, we ask for your peace and your patience, but Lord, we really do pray for your physical intervention in that problem, Lord. And we continue to pray for Robert Bradburn, that he might have access to updates on his condition, and that your healing peace will be with him and his family. So Lord, we commit to you all these people and situations that are on our hearts, and ourselves too, as we begin another week with you walking alongside us. And in your name we ask all these things. Amen. And a final prayer this morning. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the Son of Peace to you. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all the ones that you love this day and forevermore. And go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>